Westminster, the House of Parliament in London, its oldest and most exclusive institution is the House of Lords. Here, for centuries and generations, members of the British landed aristocracy have been holding on to their pump duties and privileges. Today, the leader of the House of Lords is a woman. On top of it, she's black. An extraordinary story and quite a character. Come and meet Baroness Amos of Brundesbury. How does it feel to be called a baroness? I, I find it very strange, and I still try to persuade people to call me Valerie, actually. I feel uh, more comfortable with it, but obviously it's my title. And does it happen that, you know, someone calls you Baroness Amos and you sort of turn around and say, who, who well, could that be? Well, I usually turn around when people call me Baroness rather than Baroness Amos, because, of right. course, Amos is associated uh, yes, with it's me, your name. it's my all. name. But quite often, uh, people will just call me uh, Baroness, and I sometimes think, who are they talking about? Would you have liked to be born into it? Oh, no, I don't think so. Um, I was absolutely stunned when I was asked to come into the House of Lords. Uh, very pleased to be asked, of course, but I was very surprised. and. Uh, it goes with being uh, a member of our second chamber. But I, I came here to work for a Labour government, and uh, that was part of the package. And so now you are the leader of the House of Lords. What does the job consist of? I'm always being asked that. Uh, there are many different parts to it. As leader of the House of Lords, I'm leader of the whole house. and. So it's not just being the leader of the government benches, which is a big part of it, and working on the business management and trying to ensure that the government gets its legislation through this house. It's also about representing the interests of this house in parliament as a whole. After all, we are a second chamber. Uh, we are not the elected chamber. The House of Commons absolutely takes uh, precedence. But there are times when this House feels that uh, it needs to stand up for itself in Parliament. And I have a diff quite a difficult balancing act in terms of my responsibilities as a government minister and leader of government uh, business and balancing that with uh, the expectations that the public and people have of what uh, they would like their second chamber to do. Everything in this House is done by agreement and by consensus. We as the government have a very large majority in the House of Commons, but here in the House of Lords, we command only 28% of the vote. The Conservative Party have uh, 31%. There's a large independent element. That's uh, the element that we call our cross benches. That is uh, some 27%. And then, of course, you have the Liberal Democrats. We have our bishops and archbishops. So the government here in the House of Lords has to work with the other parties, with the independents, uh, to work to reach consensus on a whole range of issues. So my job, I suppose, is it's business management, it's relationship and uh, consensus building, uh, sometimes being quite uh, tough about what the government uh, expects. But most often, it's about working with people to reach consens consensus. And of course, exercising your charm to achieve that purpose. Well, I hope so. I'm someone, um, I hope that one of the reasons that uh, the Prime Minister chose me for this job is uh, because I'm very committed to consensus uh, building. There are a couple of other things that I have to do as well in this job. I speak on Northern Ireland issues here in the House of Lords. We have no minister for Northern Ireland. That's a new area for me, and I've been learning about that over the last few weeks. I continue to speak on uh, development issues, which uh, is a historic interest of mine. And of course, I came here immediately after being Secretary of State for International Development. 
And I'm also called Lord President of the Council. That's another part of my job, which means that I preside over Privy Council meetings, uh, which are held with the Queen on a monthly basis. And I also oversee the work of the Privy Council, which is a small office in government. How old an institution is this particular one, the House of Lords? Oh, it goes back uh, centuries and it's absolutely steeped in tradition. And that's one of the reasons why it is so uh, difficult to reach consensus on the kind of change that we as a country would like to see with respect uh, to the House of Lords. There has been some kind of gathering of uh, nobles or lords uh, to advise the king. Uh, this is before we had uh, uh, queens uh, going back uh, centuries. And that tradition has evolved over many years. We then, of course, had the situation where uh, you had the arguments with respect to uh, which chamber had primacy in parliament. Uh, the very famous situation of uh, parliament, uh, in that sense, the House of Commons and the king with respect to Charles I which resulted in uh, Charles I being uh, beheaded, which completely changed the balance of power between the monarchy and parliament. You're not the first woman to actually uh, hold that position. I think As leader, no, I'm the third. The third yes. leader. But you're certainly the first black woman. I'm the first black woman, yes. So how do the lords, ha how have they reacted? Because this is certainly the most, by, by all standards, the most conservative institution in the kingdom. It's a very, uh, very conservative uh, institution. And uh, by that, I don't mean in a party political sense, but I mean in the sense in of being- In a sociological sense. In a sociological sense, being very proud of its history and tradition and uh, culture, and very mindful of that in terms of uh, looking to the future and really trying as an institution uh, to balance that tradition and culture with elements of uh, modernization. And I think that's a very difficult thing for us here in the House of Lords because it's also about the weight of power between the House of Commons and the House of Lords. In terms of how am I uh, treated and how uh, have I been treated since I've been here, I'm, I've been treated with a huge amount of um, respect uh, I think I have uh, a lot of support uh, and uh, in general I'm treated very well. But at the same time you are here because the Prime Minister Tony Blair is conducting a, a, a very radical reform, um, putting an end to the hereditary yes. system yeah. and uh, appointing only life peers. Uh, and that, of course, is badly resented in some aristocratic circles in this country. Yes, it's not going to be an easy year here. Uh, we went through the first part of this process in 1999. When this government came into power, uh, when we came into power in 1997, we had a very clear commitment to get rid of the hereditary principle from uh, the House of Lords. Why? Because we felt that uh, purely as a result of an accident of birth, it did not make you into uh, a good legislator. It wasn't. It's not because you have 16 generations of uh, landowners. It wasn't about the individuals, but about the principle. One of the difficulties that there has been in terms of trying to achieve reform of the House of Lords uh, over the last hundred years, really, has been that it's been very difficult to reach agreement as to what that reform should look like. So we were very clear when we came into power in 1997 that the first priority for us was to make the break in terms of the hereditary principle and to look at the same time or after that, if you like, as to what should replace it because previous att attempts to reform had always founded on this one thing. So we wanted to separate that. We then did a deal uh, because the, the, the government was being told that all of its uh, programs and all of its legislation here in this house 
uh, would be uh, subjected to uh, delays if we did not do some kind of deal. And we did a deal and we retained some 92 hereditary peers. In the meantime, since 1999, we've been working to try and find a way through this. So the majority of the hereditary peers went. When I came into this house in 1997, there were 750 hereditary peers. And this house, there were over 1,300 people who had the right to sit here. So as a second chamber, uh, the, si the size was too large. We had this a huge number of hereditary peers. So we've gone down to having a house of some 670. And not only waiting for them to pass away, which, which would which, have been another which, thing. Yes, because you come into this house for life. Uh, life peers uh, come in for life. We have tried to reach a degree of consensus on where do we go next, and we have not managed to find that. Uh, this House voted overwhelmingly for a fully appointed second chamber by three to one. The House of Commons couldn't agree on any of the options that were put to them with respect to what should the second chamber look like. So the government has said, well, let's finish this bit of the reform with respect to the hereditary principle. Let's, let's establish a statutory appointments commission reporting to Parliament, which will be responsible for uh, the timing of appointments to this House and for the number of appointments that are made to this House on an annual basis. That is normally determined by the Prime Minister. And let's think again about what might come after that. So that's where we're at. So it's a, it's a very British problem and a very uh, British approach. It's a very British problem and it's a very British solution, yes. What is the most difficult aspect of your of your day-to-day -day activities here? I what is the most surprising for you every time you walk into this grandiose building? I think the most surprising thing for me is that a government with such a large majority in the House of Commons continually has to uh, negotiate and find ways around getting its program here in the second chamber. Uh, it's the way that uh, this House will say that's how it's always operated. But the reality is that you have had successive years of uh, conservative government and you had an automatic inbuilt conservative majority. So we have a job to do. We have to explain to the British public that uh, what they see in terms of the relationship between the House of Lords and the House of Commons uh, is partly about politics and it's about very serious politics that the issues that are now being talked about in terms of reform of the House of Lords and that in moving to a fully appointed uh, chamber, what we're trying to do is to have a second chamber that simply does what the Commons tells it. This is not what the government is about. I think people forget that we only have 28% of the vote, that we have said absolutely clearly in our reform proposals that we don't think any one party should have a majority, and that the Prime Minister is giving up uh, considerable rights of patronage by us moving to establish uh, a statutory appointments commission. And I think that that is not wholly understood. So I think we need to convince our public about the important role that the House of Lords plays in revising and scrutinizing legislation, but also that the House of Commons is the principal chamber. It is the chamber that has elected representatives that's where the battles should be fought with respect to what the government is trying to do. And we now have a situation where our opposition are saying, well, if we've got battles to fight, we'll wait until these issues get to the House of Lords. You were born in Guyana, and you came to this country when you were? Nine. I was nine years old. And what were your parents doing and why did they come here? My parents were both teachers in Guyana. Uh, there are three of us. I'm the eldest. I have a sister and uh, a brother. 
And I think my parents were very conscious at the time that we were growing up in Guyana in the late 50s and early 60s that uh, there was no university in Guyana at that time. They had big aspirations for their children. And uh, unless we all got scholarships to universities either in the West Indies or the United Kingdom or the United States, I think they were conscious that they would not be able to pay, afford to pay for us uh, to come to university. That was one of, that was part of the thinking. My father came to this country in 1961. He came to uh, pursue a degree. When he arrived, he discovered that uh, the course he thought that he had come to study uh, did not actually match his expectations. So he started teaching here. He taught here for a couple of years, uh, missed us all. Uh, and as I said, there, the challenges they saw in terms of uh, our education meant that uh, he asked us all to come over. So my mother and the three children joined him here in 1963. And so your education uh, was, of course, was not at all uh, the, the elite edu educational system that uh, we, we know about in this country. You didn't go to what are called the public schools? No, I didn't. I went to a local uh, primary school when I arrived. In fact, it was very interesting because they didn't test uh, any of us. They just immediately put us all, that myself and my sister, my brother was only three at the time, they immediately put us into uh, the, the bottom classes. You had classes that were stratified. My mother got very angry indeed uh, and went to the school the, the following day. They did subsequently test us and we all ended up in, uh, my sister and I ended up in the top streams. And from there I went to a girls' grammar school. I was the first black girl in that school and my sister was the second uh, three years later. And then you went on to university, went but on to again, university. not to Oxford no, I, no, I went to uh, Warwick. Uh, I studied sociology there. One of the reasons I chose uh, Warwick was because their sociology degree was very different. It, you could study the sociology of developing countries. You could uh, do the sociology of race relations and uh, women's issues, sociology of uh, education. And I had a marvelous uh, three years there. It was uh, a time that was very important for students uh, across the world. The early uh, 1970s, I was very involved in campaigning on a whole number of uh, social justice and uh, equality issues. So you were already quite politicised? I was very politicised. My family, uh, we always talked. We were always encouraged to have a view uh, to argue with uh, our parents about what was happening uh, in the world, and always to have um, an international sense, uh, if you like, to think about what was happening in other parts of the world, in, in the Caribbean, South America, uh, in Africa, what was happening more widely. When and how did you first experience racism? Was it during your school years? Was it later when you went into local, local government issues? That's quite a difficult question to answer and I'll tell you why. It's partly because, as I said, um, I was the bl first black girl in the, the girls' school that I went to. Uh, we grew up in an area where there weren't many uh, black people, so although there were incidents that occurred when I was a child, for example, when my parents bought their very first house, there was uh, one uh, family on the street where the parents tried to get a petition going uh, because they didn't want a black family moving in. But the other families on the street wouldn't sign it. Uh, so it was a kind of double-edged thing. There was support on uh, one side, whilst at the same time there, there were attempts to uh, exclude us. Um, I'm very conscious of instances when I was growing up where I was very conscious of being different. Uh, I used to sing in our school choir and we would very often go and sing in what were then called uh, old people's homes and there would be women and men there who had never seen a black person, uh, perhaps on television but never in the flesh and they would touch my skin and want to touch 
my hair. So I was very, very conscious then of being different. In terms of what I would call very serious racist incidents, there was one when I was at uh, university when uh, my sister and uh, a friend of mine, it was just before I did my finals, we were subjected to uh, a racist uh, attack in uh, a little village very close to uh, Warwick, which physical is where... Physical attack? Uh, physical attack, yes. We were uh, pelted with uh, bottles and uh, they tried to fight with us and we managed to get away uh, because it just so happened that a bus came around the corner and we jumped on the bus. But uh, it was it was horrible because I had never been physically uh, attacked in, in that way. And I've been spat at on the streets of London, but this is a long time ago. I'm sure a very long time ago and, and almost like another life. Yes, almost like that. I mean, Britain has changed, I think, out of all recognition. Uh, the, the kind of food that is now available, the diversity that you see in uh, many of London's cities. That is not to say that uh, black communities, ethnic minority communities, don't experience difficulties. We have our share of that uh, here in the UK. We and you, you feel you very much the representative of such communities, having come up so high in, in the social and power ladder? It's very hard to say um, that I'm the representative of those communities. I don't see myself in that way. I'm not an elected politician. But having said that, I'm someone that has fought for justice uh, and equality all my life. And I bring that experience with me. And I want to use that experience in the part that I play in public life. So I would never say that I was uh, representative of ethnic minority communities in uh, Britain. I think that would be a presumptuous thing to say. But I do hope that the experiences that I, that I have had and the things that people talk to me about which have shaped their experiences, I want to bring those to the work that I do. I think the other side of it, and I found this very difficult to deal with for a very long time, is that uh, as you move your way through uh, public life and become more visible, because there are so few of us, there is a sense in which uh, people see you as a role model. And I found that quite difficult uh, initially because it's not how I saw myself or how I thought about myself. But it is very important uh, that people feel that they can connect with you um, I try to have young people come and shadow me. I try, I get lots and lots of respect, uh, requests to speak to uh, schools, uh, to speak to uh, ethnic minority and community organisations. I couldn't possibly do the majority of them, but I do try uh, to do them to show people that I remain concerned and connected with what they're thinking and feeling. But the, the very first day that you actually sat as the leader of the House of Lords, or maybe the very first day that you sat in a cabinet meeting as a, as a member of Tony Blair's government, did you actually remember that day where you were spat at? No, I didn't actually. I didn't, although I do have to say that subsequently uh, and, and part of the reason that I didn't make those immediate connections is uh, when I was first made a member of the Cabinet in May and became Secretary of State for International Development, it was such a shock and a surprise. I think it took me a few days to actually recover my balance of uh, equilibrium. And that's for a number of reasons. One is that as a member of the House of Lords, as a member of the unelected, chamber, it had never crossed my mind that uh, I would end up in the cabinet being the Secretary of State for International Development, which is uh, a job which covered all the things that I cared about. So uh, I spent a couple of days just actually realising it was true, I think, and getting used to uh, the idea. And it was very interesting to me that a number of people came up to me to tell me that 
I had made history. And this had happened before. When I first came into the house in 1997, I came in at the same time as uh, Patricia Scotland. She and I were uh, the first black women to come into the House of Lords. But I was actually introduced uh, just before her. There's a ceremony that you go through uh, when you arrive. So I made history in that sense. Uh, the first time I got up to speak at the dispatch box as uh, speaking on behalf of the government again as the first black woman to do that in the House of Lords. And these things were brought to my attention by other people because... You, you, don't, you didn't react, you didn't sort of say, whoa. <laughs> well, I said, wow, but all of the historical significance of it uh, became clearer to me later because I was dealing with the immediacy of it. Uh, one of the things about our system is, when I was made a member of the cabinet, uh, I was due to travel to South Africa that day. I had a whole, I was a foreign office minister. I had a huge number of uh, appointments and I received a phone call asking me to go and see the prime minister. I had no idea what it was about. I walked into number 10 Downing Street as a foreign office minister. I walked out as a member of the cabinet and as secretary of state for international development. and. I moved from the Foreign Office to development in the space of an hour. And you have to get on with your new job and you're completely focused on getting on with your new job. So having time to savour the moment, that time uh, comes later. My parents were enormously pleased. My sister insisted on having some members of our family together that night and I kind of whizzed in, <laughs> spent some time and whizzed out again. The significance of it uh, really sank in for me uh, later and it was the same when I came here and it's partly because it happened in such tragic circumstances. Our then leader, Lord Williams of Mostyn, died very suddenly. He was well loved, uh, well respected. We were all feeling the pain of his loss. And I became appointed, again, I became appointed uh, to this job and within an hour and a quarter moved from development to the House of Lords. I had to say goodbye to my team in development. I had to come here. I had to deal with some of my own emotions with uh, respect to the pain of his loss. It, 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 it takes a little longer to, to, to really realise the significance personally, I think. Why have you never actually run um, an election? You've, you've never been into that kind of a, of a fight? No, I, I haven't. And uh, when I started out, I, whilst I was at school, but then whilst I was at university, I've always been involved in campaigning, but always in a way from the other side, from outside organisations, trying to get organisations uh, to change. And I suppose I made a big decision, which was uh, after I'd finished my university training, I had a choice. Uh, I could have uh, gone into academia, uh, and I decided I did not want to do that. I wanted to, to find jo a job and experience into uh, the, the world of, action. Of, of work as opposed to uh, working in uh, academia. And I made some decisions about where I wanted to live. I wanted to come back to London. At that time, I was living in uh, Birmingham, and I applied for a job in local government, which uh, I was very uh, lucky, and I got it. And I continued, in a way, my campaigning because I, in working in local government, I was working as initially as a race relations advisor, trying to uh, get the organisation to change and take on board race equality issues. Although I was a, a member of staff and then I uh, was a women's equality advisor and at that point I had no kind of sense that I, I wanted to become a, a, either a, a, a local councillor or But you, you, of, you, of you've parliament. always been a Labour uh, yes, and militant. I've, and I've, yes, and I've, I've always been involved in uh, working and fighting for uh, justice and equality but somehow the thought of of running for parliament didn't really uh, cross my mind. And, and didn't they come to you? I mean, the, the, all these people who run the Labour Party, you know, 
looking at I a very bright, successful, young I was approached, black I was woman. approached later, uh, uh, before the 1997 election, as to whether or not uh, I wanted to uh, become a prospective uh, parliamentary uh, candidate. And uh, I said no. Why? Uh, again, uh, because I thought that uh, I could achieve more by trying to push the system from outside, if you like. Uh, well, then when the opportunity came in 1997 to come in as uh, a working peer, I thought about it. Um, but how did that come to you? You, you got a telephone call from the I Prime got Minister? A, I got a telephone call, not from the Prime Minister, from uh, the Prime Minister's office. I was actually in South Africa. At that time I was doing a lot of uh, work in uh, South Africa with the South African government and I was in Johannesburg and I got a message that uh, uh, someone in number 10 wanted to speak to me. And I assumed that it was about uh, the possibility of my knowing people who perhaps could be considered for various roles. I had, I had no thought in my mind that it was about me. And, uh, and yet that's precisely what And that's what precisely happened. what it was about. Um, I was asked, that, I was told the Prime Minister wanted to know if I'd be prepared to come into the House of Lords. I asked how much time I had to think about it and they said I had the weekend. Uh, and I thought long and hard about it uh, and decided that uh, for a number of reasons. One, that there weren't any black women here. I knew it would be difficult trying to juggle my work and uh, being here, but also that uh, there were some important things that this government was committed to, uh, for example, uh, on human rights, uh, which uh, I could make a contribution to from you, the back You never benches. felt you could be used as a, a sort of token uh, representative, a sort of uh, symbol of what the Labour government wants to portray. The image that it wants to portray. I've never, I've never thought that. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's quite difficult actually, because when I look back over my career, there have been a number of places when I have been the first one. Uh, and uh, what I always say to people is that somebody has to be first. Someone has to do it. And I'm not going to have a label stuck on me, which is that because I'm the first. I'm, You're not going to am, feel guilty about it. I am some it, kind of token, and I'm not <laughs> going to feel guilty about it. I know uh, I'm someone who I know I've worked hard in uh, my career. I know that there are some things that I do uh, uh, well. And at no stage have I ever thought that I was being asked to do something uh, in a tokenistic way. Now, you could say that uh, that's overconfident. But that's how I have felt, and I think that quite often, uh, if you're a woman, if you're a black, you're a black person, you're made to feel that somehow you don't deserve what you have uh, because you're the first or you're one of a few. I think we shouldn't be looking to the people. We should be looking to our systems, uh, which aren't necessarily flexible enough and aren't open enough to allow diversity to emerge. So I see it in quite a different way. H how many representatives of minority groups are there here in, in the British Parliament? House of Commons, House of Lords? Well, he, we don't, here in the House of Lords, we don't keep the figures in terms of uh, ethnic minority representation. About 16%, just under 17% actually, of uh, the number of uh, people in the House of Lords are women, so it's not very large. In the House of Commons, in terms of women's representation, we've seen it fall slightly. It was at a high in uh, 1997, where uh, Labour managed to get 101 women MPs, and then there were some from the other parties too, in a parliament of uh, over 650. But the trend is declining. But the trend is declining. In terms of ethnic minority uh, representation, we have, I mean, here in the House of Lords, um, I have, uh, we have a Muslim woman and a Muslim man on our, uh, on our benches, on the Labour benches. Uh, we have peers whose backgrounds are in India, Bangladesh, uh, Pakistan. 
but these are all single figures. Mm. Uh, they're not, uh, we're not in any way uh, a critical mass. And the same applies in the House of Commons. So we have a lot of work to do uh, to reflect uh, the greater diversity of Britain in our political institutions. But you feel that in comparison to other European countries, uh, Britain is, is going in the right direction or it's slagging behind? It's very hard to say. I think, I think one of the things that we try to do, and it's not an easy thing to do, uh, is to balance what we're doing in terms of uh, a managed migration process uh, and tackling issues with respect to immigration, dealing with uh, asylum, which is a big issue uh, for us as uh, a country. But the third element of that is building community cohesion. And we have certainly seen uh, recently, uh, particularly with respect of UK action in uh, Iraq, uh, work in terms of global action on terrorism and so on, a greater uh, schism emerging between our Muslim communities here uh, in the UK and other communities. And this is something that we as a government have been taking very, very seriously indeed, because whilst we have said and believe absolutely strongly that uh, you can't tie in uh, the entire Muslim population to a global war on terror, it is also about how people feel in the communities in which they live. So building community cohesion and actually trying to ensure that uh, Muslim communities feel that they are not under attack, uh, either because of the way that the press represents those communities or the way that people use particular kinds of language, is a very, very important thing for us to do indeed. You, you've always been uh, loyal to, to Tony Blair and, and obviously this Prime Minister has uh, promoted you in, in a very uh, obvious and, uh, and uh, in, in a very obvious manner. How do you view his decline in popularity and uh, uh, after the, the war in Iraq? Do you think that uh, he still, Tony Blair still stands a chance to, to win the next election, which of course would be a historical and feat, historic or? third term, yes. I do. I feel that very strongly. I think that uh, one of the things about uh, Tony Blair and about this government is that we're a brave government. I mean, there are all kinds of easy options that we could have taken to maintain our popularity, but they would not have dealt with the issues that we did need to deal with as a country. And one of the things I feel about Tony Blair as leader of the Labour Party, but also as the Prime Minister, is that he is someone who does not shirk away either from making uh, the difficult decisions. He shows extraordinary leadership, I think, in those situations. And if in thinking about uh, Iraq, and I was just on uh, the fringes of that uh, in my role in uh, the Foreign Office. It's a, such a difficult decision for any Prime Minister to have to make with respect to uh, taking his country into war. Especially but, when his own public opinion drifts away. When uh, uh, there's such strong public opinion and such differences being uh, talked about by our citizens, but also within Parliament. But I think even, it's not just on the international agenda, I also think it's about our domestic uh, agenda. If you look at what is happening, uh, not just in countries across Europe, but elsewhere in the world, with respect to what's happening to public services, the funding of those public services, uh, wanting to expand public services, for example, in areas like health and education, but with populations where uh, the working part of uh, the population is having uh, to fund more and more in terms of an aging population. We have to uh, transform our public services. We have to look at different ways of funding them. And we have taken these issues on head on. It's not necessarily been popular, but it's for the long term uh, benefit of the country. And it's a very difficult, 
difficult balance to get right. Because of course I want the Labour Party uh, to continue to win elections. I want us to win a historic third term. But it means that we have a responsibility to explain to the British public why we are taking the kind of long-term view that we're taking, but also try to demonstrate uh, some immediate impact. And it's not always an easy thing to do. The easy thing for a government to do is to do the things that deliver an immediate impact and forget about the long term. We try to do both. And Gordon Brown's management of the economy over the last six years, of course, has uh, helped us to do that. So you don't feel uncomfortable in the least? And you, are you proud to be part of this government and I'm this I'm very, action? I'm very proud to be part of, of this government. Um, I think that, that people forget uh, because there is collective responsibility in government. And I, I care passionately about that. And I believe in that absolutely uh, passionately. People think that because there's collective responsibility in government, that there aren't uh, differences which are discussed uh, amongst uh, the members of, of government. Of course there are, but I'm proud to be part of a Labour government. It's what I want to see. I don't want a return to a Conservative government here in the United Kingdom. Of course, we have the vagaries of politics, and at some point there will be a return to a Conservative government, but I don't want it to be next time. I don't want it to be for a very long time. Baroness Amos, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.